Hello, friends. This is Dolores Williams of DW's View. Stand up. If we do not stand up for what we believe, who will? My sponsor helps keep this podcast on the air. And I want to thank my sponsor, Ms. Kim Yader. Kim is a peak performance coaching. If you're feeling stuck in any area of your life on a personal or professional level, and you just can't move forward, then you need to get in contact with my personal coach, Ms. Kim Yater. You can reach Kim at Kim Yater, Y-E-A-T-E-R at Calendly, C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y dot com forward slash Kim Yater. It's okay to be stuck, but it's not okay to stay stuck. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to DW's View Stand Up. To my audience, I want to thank you for coming and listening to this podcast once again. I don't take your time for granted. And today I am interviewing a very, very special young man named Kevin McGarry. And I want to thank Mr. Con Holiday for making this introduction. Uh, Kevin McGarry is an entrepreneur, an author, and public speaker in the arena of civic engagement. Kevin serves as chairman of the Frederick Douglass Foundation of California, and he is an executive with Douglass Leadership Institute and the North Star Leadership Pack. A lot more to tell about Kevin. I can't tell it all, but he has entrepreneurial skills as he has started and participated in a number of startups. Kevin leads a collection of proactive individuals committed to developing innovative and new approaches to today's socio-political issues and with the assistance of elected officials and a merit of community activists, he lectures and provides workshops about today's most perplexing issues. Help me welcome my new friend, Kevin McGarry. Good morning, Kevin, how are you today? Good morning. Thank you for having me here, Dolores. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak to you oh, and your audience. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. <laughs> and I want you to please share all your information because your word needs to get out. Because, mm -hmm. I, I mean, just want to say, you know, when people start going through your information, you just can't stop. It took me so long to go through that website because I said, oh my goodness, I got to go back and listen. I got to go back and listen. But you're having such an impact, and, yeah. and I thank God for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, briefly tell us about the Frederick uh, Douglass Foundation and your duties as chairman. So the Frederick Douglass Foundation is a, um, a black, uh, black led organization. We have a national footprint. I just happen to have the California chapter of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. We are here to carry out the legacy of the Honorable Frederick Douglass. As you know, Frederick Douglass uh, was a conservative Republican, worked very, very uh, closely with uh, President Abraham Lincoln to, on the emancipation and all kinds of things. He yes. was a real pivot point in our history because through Douglass, we saw the women's rights movement, we saw uh, the Underground Railroad movement. He, so he was he was in collaboration with Susan B. Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. He was in collaboration with Harriet Tubman. Um, he was uh, obviously a civil, the, the first civil rights pioneer uh, in our history. So there's so many things about this man. And uh, so we would, what we try to do is to, her, first of all, help people understand who Frederick Douglass was. And second of all, help them to understand how important civic engagement is uh, borrowing from the legacy of Douglas to participate in today's culture and society. Um, and then we try to help people understand how significant Douglas was, not only as a statesman, but as a minister. So mm -hmm. we're working with a lot of black and brown church leadership mm -hmm. to help them to embrace the gospel as Douglas did. Yes. And that's what helped him to overcome the hatred, the venom, the venom and bitterness that he felt towards those that had enslaved him, whipped him within an inch of his life and all of that. So we mm -hmm. try to help, uh, you know, the current 
uh, mostly urban churches, black and brown churches, understand the significance of applying the gospel to your civic engagement. Yes. And we borrow from the legacy of Douglas so we could see how important that is and how it always comes out. We always come out on top if we can do it that way. So that's 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 kind of how we how we just dispose that. Oh, great. Great. And I, I, I'm sure you're having a, a wonderful impact being involved with that group. Yeah, so we try to have impact. The, the reality is, though, is a lot of black and brown churches, while they recognize Douglas as an important figure and significant figure in our history, the reality is, is a lot of them are smitten with culture and society. So yeah. it, it seems like we have to keep pounding them with, mm -hmm. look, when you go to the ballot box, when you encourage your people to vote, that's great, but encourage them to look through the lens of the Bible and yeah. not the lens of culture to make their decisions. Yeah. And that is a hard net, hard message for some black and brown churches because they want to continue to vote based on tradition, history, yeah. culture, uh, grandma and them, mom and them. They, they when I was you know X amount year old, and I went, I asked them which who, which party do I, and they told me which party to, vote, and that's how I've been voting, and that's how I'm going to continue to vote. Yeah. So they sort of usurp the word of God with their own personal desires. And that's why we're in the predicament we are in today. Mm. In <laughs> totally agree with you on that one. Yes. Now, what is a, a CRT, which is critical race theory for dummies? You created that. And what was the purpose of creating that? Yeah, so uh, critical race theory. A lot of people have been hearing about it. But, you yeah. know, when, when President Trump came out, I guess it's been about nine months or maybe closer to a year now. And he says, look, we're going to stop at the federal level uh, educating and promoting critical race theory in our educational, uh, you know, for our three letter uh, agencies uh, as part of their educational resources and foundations, we're going to stop any investment, any additional investment in critical race theory. And he, and so a lot of people began to say, well, what is CRT and how is that? And then we started to see uh, other states like Ron DeSantis just recently saying, we're not, we're going to make sure that uh, as far as education in Florida, as far as any of our government agencies, we're going to dismantle critical race theory as part of that curriculum. So uh, a lot of people are wondering, well, I don't even know what critical race theory is. What is it? How do I wrap my arms around it? And so what we wanted to do is come up with a quick and easy way to convey to people what critical race theory is and what it is not. Uh, quite honestly, it's a, it's a lofty uh, explanation because it's completely illogical. Uh, it's, it has no principle foundation. It has no moral foundation. And so it's one of those things that when you try to convey to people what it is, they can easily get lost. So we did the CRT for Dummies podcast. Uh, it was a Zoom call. We had people calling, you know, actually participating from across the country. And we gave them just a primer, uh, the main, the main uh, you know, sort of a synthesis of critical race theory. And so they could begin to try to wrap their minds around it. The reality is, is CRT is, um, it, it's, it's an ideology that is an intellectual sort of exercise. And it, it's, it's really geared towards, you know, sort of this intellectual audience, uh, highly educated people, uh, highly, you know, professors and intellectuals alike love it because it's so amorphic. In other words, it, it's, it, it, it can almost be whatever you want it to be to sort of manipulate people and people groups and culture to do what you want them to do. Um, so it's that kind of a thing. So what we, what we conveyed in our CRT for Dummies is just a quick synopsis of what it is. And here is the synopsis. Uh, essentially, when Marx was around, he he sort of had the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. Bourgeoisie would be the sort of the well-to-do people on the top tier, uh, proletariat be your working class people. And it would always be sort of class conflict between these two groups. In today's nomenclature, because they know that using lofty terms like bourgeoisie with our sort of short attention, attention span, it's kind of hard for get, to get you know, so they came up with oppressor versus the oppressed, or the powerful versus the powerless. 
And they use these sort of paradigms and these dichotomies to pit us against one another. So um, the oppressor class would be anybody that lacks melanin or has very little melanin in their skin. That would be anybody that's white. And so, uh, so they use race and race grievance mm -hmm. to sort of, they've reframed it that the oppressor are all whites. Yeah. And um, the oppressed would be then all, and mostly black, but all people of color. And uh, therefore you must hate whites, you must um, sort of um, uh, disempower them, uh, degrade them, uh, dismiss them, uh, take away their voice, take away their power. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that kind of a thing. Uh, but in essence, for all of your listeners, it's just think of it when you hear critical race theory or you begin to see people that are trying to guilt you because you're a certain color or a certain heritage that that's critical race theory being played out before you. And it's oppressed, or it's the oppressor versus the oppressed. And the oppressed would be all of those who are not white. Yeah, very dangerous stuff. It, it is, it is. Yeah. Now, um, according to your website, and I agree with you, America is on fire. And you started Every Black Life Matters. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, when we, you know, everybody I've ever t spoken to about what happened last summer yeah. agrees that what we saw was hard to look at. Nine and a half minutes, nine minutes and 45 seconds of somebody with their uh, knee on a neck uh, of somebody else. Yeah. Um, and we don't have to get into the minutia of whether he yeah. was under the influence and it, it's still, it's egregious what happened. And um, so everybody that we've talked to, everybody that I know, saw and we had the sentiment like wow doesn't black lives matter i mean it seems like black lives matter too why why are we why do you treat this black man this way and we don't see this kind of uh, egregious behavior across the spectrum and so that's why we had the the riots and the violence and the destruction of property the destruction of black and brown businesses uh, mostly, and uh, the, across the country, we saw this sort of uh, collective uh, voice saying this, we've had enough, and Black Lives Matter, and all of this. And what occurred to, to me and my co-founder, Neil Mammon, is uh, we agree with the sentiment, but after you look at the organization Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. uh, there's some real troubling aspects to that organization, that if you're a person of faith, you, you know, you can't really get on with that organization. And what the organization had publicly announced that they were at the time, now they tried to scrub a lot of their site and take some of these more controversial stances off their site, but what they agreed what they were at the time was they're revolutionary Marxists, um, yeah. that, they, that they're all about the transgender, um, you know, transgender cause that they were uh, all about just really white officer on black citizen type um, uh, type uh, brutality. So, um, and then they, they were all about destruction of the nuclear family. Uh, mm -hmm. They were all about encouraging uh, that fathers not be a part of the nuclear family. Um, and they were uh, in, cahoots actually with Planned Parenthood and a lot of other nefarious organizations that actually hurt the mm -hmm. black community. Uh, then we had saw on top of that, that they were practicing witchcraft and incantations. Uh, so they're also mm -hmm. avowed um, sort of witchcraft type organization. Uh, so all of these were really troubling. It was like, if you're a person of faith or if you're a church or you, mm -hmm. we have to have some other avenue to express the outrage, uh, but not necessarily sign on with that. So what we decided to do was start Every Black Life Matters. What we felt was that the Lord was telling us, look, you can start another organization ancillary and just try to combat the narrative that way. But the more important thing is to be in the exact same lane and just reframe the argument. So what we decided to do is start Every Black Life Matters because it sort of borrows from their nomenclature. But what we're doing is we're saying, look, 
every black life matters from the womb to the tomb, from conception to natural death. Every phase of black life in between is vitally important to us all. And there are, there are very specific plights that are still there today in, you know, with black life. Yeah. There is a plight in the womb mm -hmm. where you have certain organizations who have designed and strategized to exterminate blacks. Yeah. There is plight in early childhood development. There is plight in the educational system that strictly relegates black and brown communities and, and, and really tethers them to the public school system. There is plight when we see the, the, the level and degree of fatherlessness. There is plight when we see stray bullets tearing through walls and taking the life of our children um, because of a drive-by shooting. These are very specific plights that are directed in the black community that other communities don't have. So, you know, we understand that people are want to be quick to say, no, 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 all lives matter, all lives matter. We're all the same. Uh, I have to back them up and say, look, um, of course all lives matter. But if, when you say that, you're dismissing the significance of what's happening in the black community. There is plight there today that whites and other minorities just don't have. You're not targeting yeah, them. And, and, yeah, and, and they don't, and, and some people do not understand, and we'll get more into that a little later, but uh, now there is an effort by the Biden administration to purge um, conservatives and Christians from the military and using the NSA and CIA um, to label them as religious extremists. And right. I think that's all part of this critical race stuff, which uh, seems to be on steroids in the government uh, today. And I know President uh, Trump remove that from the military, he said, so wait a minute, we don't need to be training our military in, in this critical race stuff because how can a military function and, and protect this country if they're divided? Yeah, and, that, exactly right. Uh, so there is a concerted area. So here's the thing, um, a lot of people in the body of Christ really need to understand that we are under attack. And yes. it's not subtle anymore. It's, um, you know, we are being persecuted. Uh, we're persecuted church mm -hmm. in America today. And yes. the, one of the most telling things is all of these things that are coming out of this new administration, uh, the Biden administration, where, whereby we do see that Christians and people that may have some conservative thoughts or leanings are literally being targeted. Uh, yes. and, and they're being targeted as domestic terrorists. And if they work within the government agencies, if they're part of the military, if they're part of uh, the government itself, um, they are being targeted and being expunged uh, because they're, they're seen as either domestic terrorists or as extremists. Now, um, critical race theory does set up this kind of an environment. Um, basically, uh, it, 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 it's primary uh, mode is, uh, we hear the term a lot now, equity. And uh, under the auspices of equity, we see these different governmental departments saying, look, um, we have some holdovers here from who had the mindset of the last administration. They're obviously more of a supremacist mindset, and we're all about equity. So we need to begin to de-emphasize or expunge these people out of the government. So they are targeting them based on their stance in life. They are targeting Christians today uh, and trying to classify us as domestic terrorists. And as you know, the NSA collects all communications from everybody in the United States. And so if Christians now are targeted as terrorists, um, they can actually uh, really focus and emphasize Christians and take away our rights um, un under the auspices of the domestic uh, terrorism uh, policies that are already in place. So it's we're, we're, we've, we've crossed the chasm. We're in a dangerous point in our history. Yeah. Um, and there is a downward tra trajectory in culture and society and on our religious uh, systems. And it's time now, God is calling his church, yeah. the remnant church, to stand up and take your positions of authority in culture and society. And we know we have positions of authority because Jesus told us we did. 
uh, Matthew 28. He says, now all power yeah. in heaven and earth has been given to me. And basically I'm giving that to you. So go therefore yeah. and teaching men all things that you have observed and, uh, and uh, making disciples. And yeah, I'm paraphrasing, but. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I understand. But, yeah, because. But, but basically people should reacquaint themselves with the, with the mandate uh, now, Kevin, uh, there is uh, an effort by the Biden administration uh, to purge conservatives and Christians from the military and from society in the United States, which is very dangerous. Can you comment on that uh, as, as in talking about this critical race theory? Yeah, so he here's where we, where we are. We're literally at a point in our history where the church is being targeted and people of faith are being targeted and people that are conservatives are being targeted and they're being targeted under the auspices of equity. Uh, CRT, it really focuses, uh, you know, one of its primary points is equity. And of course we have the oppressor and the oppressed. Those with equity are of course, are being seen as those that are supremacist or privileged or white or all of the above. And therefore, within these government agencies, within um, you know this administration, the current Biden administration, uh, this is their way of trying to level the playing field. Uh, but basically, what happens is now we're having people that are being uh, uh, unmercifully uh, expunged out of their government jobs. Uh, they are being um, targeted within government agencies if they happen to be a. Uh, a layover from the past administration uh, just because of their thoughts, because of their feelings about conservatism, or uh, they may be more, you know, uh, more right type leaning. And, and so we have these types of, 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 of strategies that are going after uh, these people. Now, regrettably as well, is, is, is not only are you targeting conservatives and those that are being deemed as supremacists, but you're targeting uh, people of faith. So you're targeting now uh, uh, the church. And so we have people of faith that are being persecuted. And now is the time where God is calling the remnant to take a stand, to stand up for righteousness, to stand up for justice, and to uh, not be cowardly and kowtow to culture as it starts to take this bend and target us. But now is the time for us to actually stand up for righteousness and justice. So CRT, while some would try to excuse it, it does have very dangerous outcomes and the outcomes are now targeted against the church. Now, as you know, if, the, if you have people of faith that are targeted as being terrorists or domestic terrorists, or you have uh, you know, others because of the way that they're, they, they're thinking uh, to be classified as extremists, the NSA could then begin to spy on us individually they right now they collect all the data for all communications for everybody in the united states and then some abroad but uh, they can begin to hone in and target specific individuals now under the auspices of domestic terrorism so we're now entering an age where the church is literally being persecuted and regrettably we have a lot of people in the church that are asleep that are tacitly you know complicit with it um, and we've got to do better. We have to wake up and begin to really stand for what we stand for. Yeah, but, but you know, the danger, uh, uh, Kevin, is that a lot of people in the church don't real, they just really don't realize it. And when you, when you try to, to tell them, they kind of go, it's like, you're the enemy. It's like, they, right. they really don't believe you. And right. though they know you, they don't trust what you're telling them is true. And right. that's, that's to, to me, is very dangerous. It's like uh, with the military, very dangerous what they're doing to cancel out the very people who, when we look back at the Constitution, our military has been there from the founding of this country. Yep. And, have, and we have to have a military that actually works and yes. works together. I mean, the critical race stuff, there's no place for that in the military. So you have no, people I mean, that have to work together. I mean, it's very dangerous stuff. Yeah, when you think about the military, you think about sort of our our um, last line of defense. Now we have we have police, we have all kinds of law enforcement throughout the country, but the military is our last line of defense 
here in the United States. But more importantly, abroad, they're our first line of defense. So they are literally carrying out the duties to help protect America and its interests here and abroad. Here's the issue. Do we want people who are principally trained and, and fine-tuned and uh, can go out and actually do the job? Or do we want to make sure that we have equity in our military branches where we have a certain amount of women, a certain amount of transgenders, a certain amount of, of, of these types of things, or a certain amount of people who think in a particular way, what's more important for us? I always thought that we needed to have the, main, the meanest, baddest, leanest um, uh, fighting force uh, in the world so that we can carry out the duties and protect our interests and protect the interests of the military actually uh, while we're abroad. Now, if, we, if we, we start bringing these other groups in without the first standard being that of a military person who protects the interests of America, but instead looking at other sort of more arbitrary uh, type characteristics like, are you transgender? Are you a female? And, and like that, then we're not going to have the most effective fighting force on the planet. We're going to have sort of a mismatch of people. And when they're in the battlefield, what happens is, is we're, you know, some of those people will could potentially make uh, the entire fighting force uh, more uh, susceptible to yeah. things that could happen on the battlefield. So you know, we, have to, we have to really either focus on being the best, meanest, baddest, leanest fighting force on, on the planet or not. And I think right now they're saying, we don't need to be, we're gonna focus in and make sure that we get our social interest and in, in, yeah. in equity in our military. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, not, that's not, it's doing a disservice for us as Americans. Yeah, but you, but you know, that's, that's been done uh, by design. It's no yeah. accident. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Now, the CRT and Black Lives Matter, <laughs> they teach a lot of stuff that's, I know you've talked about it, and but their objective, they have no morality, no objective truth. I was reading this on your website. Truth is a social construct. Yep. They don't say that truth does not exist, but only certain people have access to it. I thought that was really, <laughs> so right. only certain people have access to it. Right, yeah, right. I, yeah I, I read that and it was like, you gotta be kidding me. Now their curriculum is being taught in many schools across the country, which I've talked about before, which is for parents. You know, we come on here to try to tell people the truth, uh, you know, Kevin, see, find out what they're teaching because our right. kids have been manipulated and that curriculum has no business in the schools of America. They're even right. starting with pre-K kids, advertisement to teach them to hate the country. And I, I said, Lord, do parents know what, what's happening? And, yeah. and the curriculum being taught. Now, America is in, is in trouble. Now, CRT, they see racists in everything. Everything is about race, 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 and hate, hate, hate. And I, I, how, how have we gotten here? We removed God, I believe, so much. Uh, we've removed him from our society. And I think that's why we find ourselves where we are. Yes, yes. So a little bit about uh, what, at the end of the day, what happens when they say there's no real objective morality or truth or anything like that. So here's what happens. Within the frame of critical race theory, they say that lived experience is the most important factor, not objective truth, not you know reality. And so if you can imagine this, what they're seeing now is look, our, our systems like the Dewey Decimal System, arithmetic, uh, physics, uh, all of these things were developed by white men. Uh, the hegemony, uh, which would be those that are more dominant in society, developed all of these structures. Therefore, um, uh, those structures can be dismantled. So if you can imagine that one plus one doesn't equal two anymore, it's somebody's lived experience uh, that's how arcanely insane this is. So taking it to that degree. Now, if you were to actually uh, play this out over the next generation 
and you say that we have engineers that have come through the ranks without real engineering discipline, but their you know their lived experience would have them calculate basic you know algorithms and physics uh, formulas in a different way, then we can come up with uh, then as their engineering in the future we can easily come up with planes that don't fly. We can easily come up with, 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 with doctors that don't really know uh, the consequences of their very intricate operations. Because now again, the main thing with CRT is lived experience and yes. that we should dismantle all systems of, of hegemony. And so, uh, so a lot of this stuff really starts to get dangerous when it's practice uh, and actually, if we carry it out in the future, we could see some real consequences for these actions. But that's how they sort of justify that there, there is no objective truth. What there is, is your lived experience. And this is where we get into some intersectionality. What they, what they say is, look, if you're a white woman, your lived experience is much less significant than a black female um, you know, lesbian. And so you're dismissed as a white woman. We're going to listen to the lived experience of this black female lesbian. Now, even the black female lesbian is pushed to the back and she's not really the one that's going to carry forth with her words because if there's a transgender uh, male, um, um, uh, transgender male, black, and Filipino and um, you, you, you get it. The more yep. sort of mm -hmm. oppression points you get, you can gather yeah. under who you are, that becomes the one who has the most significance in the room. So, so now we're, we're, we were dismissing a lot of people and we're saying, no, we wanna listen to this one who has the most uh, oppression. And that is the opinion that carries the weight. In, in the room. And so you can see very clearly how this can turn very dangerous because now we have people, their lived experience may have been chaotic, may have been, um, it, it, you know, we should sympathize with their lived experience, whatever that is. But for us to just give them uh, the capacity now to, and an authority to make definitive uh, proclamations about you know, what we should do as a, as a group or society and that, it becomes really, really crazy when we start doing stuff like this. Yeah, and I, I see a lot of craziness, uh, Kevin, going on when, when I see, like you talked about uh, airline pilots, oh, we have to have you fly a plane just because of the color of your skin, right. not the skill. And, and when, I mean, you get into dangerous territory, just like boys taking over girls sports right. on day one. Well, no, we're going to have the transgender. We, we cannot protect girls' sports. It can't be just girls on this team. We have to do transgender. And my question is, why can't transgenders have their own team? Why do you have to take over girls' sports? Right. You're transgender. There are others who are transgender. Create your own. Right. Why destroy, uh, cancel out the girls who've worked their whole lives for, you know, for their particular sport or whatever it is that they do? Um, yeah. I'm just, what's, really, you know, what's really crazy, Dolores, is you have these feminist movements and these feminists that are all in line with the transgender movement. They don't really care about the girls and young ladies that are being uh, disproportionately affected, and especially the Black athletes. You know, a lot of our Black female athletes, they, they get to the college of choice based on, you know, their track and volleyball and, and other sports. And now, as we start to bring transgenders into the girls' sports, we're actually creating another class of male privilege. And the feminists are all in line with it. Mm. Because, and, and the reason why I say male privilege is because now if I'm a male, a biological male, and I, didn't, I haven't had the ability to really compete at the, at the biological male level, I could simply say, look, I'm going to compete with the girls and say, I'm a transgender. I can keep all of my body parts. All I have to do is make that public, public proclamation, go on the girls team, shower with them, you know, and, and, and participate in their sports. Mm -hmm. um, 
and 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 really take over uh, biologically female sports, and and the feminist movement is all in with this. And, and like I don't I said, understand it, that. Yeah, I don't understand, I don't understand either. That. It's, it's really it's really male privilege because yeah. now you're saying you, you know we used to hear the cries of well you, you know male privilege and you know uh, you know masculine males and and how we need to cancel them and all of that you know. And then now the feminist movement are actually creating another category of male privilege. And so where are the females in this? The biological females, they're, they're, they're constantly being put upon by these other realms uh, that are, are, you know, that, that, that get more privilege than they actually get. And this, mm-hmm. is, this is the dichotomy that the, the feminist movements were supposed to solve. But now they're actually uh, bringing, helping bring it forth. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. Now, now Western, Western Marxism uh, philosophies were derived, derived from the Frankfurt School developed in Germany in the 1930s yes. and all based on the ideas of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud. Now, they were Jewish atheists yeah. and also Hitler took his cue from them as well as John Dewey. Now, we, yes. we have schools named after you know this guy yeah now we're changing the names of people who founded the country but a guy who's a marxist i haven't heard anyone talk about taking that name off the schools of marxists yes and, and many others with that uh mentality yeah yeah critical race theory let's talk a little bit about the history so critical theory yeah. was actually developed out of the frankfurt school as you as you said uh the frankfurt school so the individuals there's four or five men that escaped hitler's germany no, they were Marxists, but they weren't the crazed Marxists like Hitler's, like Hitler. And so they left. They said, look, this guy, he's really going to take this country down. We better get out of here or we're going to be next on the chopping block, so to speak. So they left and went and set up the Frankfurt School uh, in the uh, uh, sociology division of Columbia University here in America. And so from the Frankfurt School, they started to then experiment with critical theory. So they had critical legal theory, and then they started to uh, do some things there. And then they, uh, they really found that they can dismantle the family and cause a lot of racial grievance if they were to actually develop critical race theory, which is what we're talking about today. So they really started to, to do this and make sure society started to take hold with other professors. And, um, and so that's, that's where a lot of this, that's where all of it has come from. It started from a Marxist frame. Uh, so somebody that is embracing critical theory or critical race theory, they can't disavow Marxism because it's fundamentally, it's part of the roots. That's why we're, you know, Marxism, anybody who understands classic Marxism, it's you create class, you know, class divisions and class chaos and grievances amongst the society. So ultimately, the society will collapse. You can reinvent it under a Marxist scheme, starting with socialism, then uh, then evolving to Marxism, and then evolving to pure communism. But the mm-hmm. whole intent from the, from the start is communism. That's what the intention yeah. is with the Marxism frame. So, um, and so that's, that's where we are today. I mean, we're... Yeah we're along this trajectory and, and that's, but that's where critical theory actually came from. It did come from people who escaped Hitler's Germany and uh, set up here in Columbia University in America under the Frank, under the auspices of the Frankfurt School in Columbia. Yeah, you know, when, I, when you look at communism and, and how evil it is and when we see what it's done and how it's devastated countries, yep. why would anyone wanna to lean towards that? And, and, uh, but I guess it's about power and control over people. No, absolutely. It always is. It always yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. There's no good outcome for that. Now, the LGBT uh, community is brainwashing our children. And I, you know, I was, I, look, I was looking at the governor of Arkansas this week signing this bill that would allow children to take puberty blockers. Those drugs will castrate uh, these children and, and cause great damage irreversible damage to them. Now, why would someone, now you can't give them an aspirin without a parent's permission. There are things that children, you just can't do, but yet something so critical as changing them forever, 
I, I don't understand this attack on young people and on children, you know, who are not able to make these, these decisions. Even, even adults uh, uh, have regret who've gone into this kind of stuff, have had regret. And you have a child that's not even developed. And yeah. I, I just don't understand that, uh, Kevin. Yeah, so some of the things that we see with that's happening with our children, they're being sexually groomed from kindergarten yes. to the 12th grade, mm -hmm. sexually groomed by adults. So we used to frown up the, on this and call them sexual predators and child, uh, child predators, and we used to throw people like this in jail. Now we have teachers, adults, that are sexually yeah. grooming our students, right? By showing them props, this is how you do it, this is how you use yeah. this, this is what it's for, this is how you should experiment with your body, these are the, the, yeah. the things that you, you can do on your own time with your body, you know, all of this kind of stuff. We have mm -hmm. adults teaching children this. Now, that to me is being, is child predatory practices, but okay, so we have that on one extreme. Now, we also have schools saying, look, uh, little Johnny, do you want to be, um, do you want to be a girl? Now, Think about little Johnny, think about a little black boy. Think about me when I was five years old. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't raised with a single parent. So both my parents still married to this, this, this day, as a matter of fact, 62 years, God bless them. But, um, but if I were in a single parent household, young black boy, and I had two older sisters and a mom at the house, and if they had given me the option. Do you want to be, you know, little Johnny, little yeah. Kevin? Do you want to be, you know, I would have said, well, I love my older sister. I love my mom. I would like to just be one of the girls. I mean, that's an easy calculus for, for a kid that doesn't really know the consequences of this stuff. And now we're subjecting our children to come up with these sort of arbitrary um, proclamations about their gender, which we know it's fixed biologically and by DNA by God, you yes. can't change it. That's right. um, and, and now we have these uh, kids that are gullible and susceptible to influence, especially by teachers uh, who are already child predators, in my opinion, yes. um, uh, really influencing our children to, to take on these other um, you know, personalities that are permanent and life altering. These are huge decisions being made by five-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Uh, Ten-year-olds. I mean, it's 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 so uh, irresponsible, yeah. and yet we've allowed this. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And and I mean, everything is just upside down, you know, Kevin. When we have a prison system saying, "Oh, well, after two years, three years, we're going to completely erase a person's background," yeah. so you never knew what that person did in the past, and. Yeah. And, and so you're hiring so many people be hiring people are hiring people that you have no clue of the evil stuff that took place in their background. So you don't, right. you bring a wolf in among sheep yeah. and you don't even know it because their right. backgrounds have been erased. And that's just how crazy uh, things are. Mm. Now, I want to move to a different subject. Uh, now in Georgia, it was a big debate about the election and there's yeah changing their laws, making them common sense. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so what, what's happening in Georgia? understand the truth about it. Yeah, so the truth about what's happening in Georgia is this. Georgia had a lot of what they call irregularities. It's what I call fraud and abuse and schemes to overrule and manipulate the votes for that particular state. So Georgia knows that they kind of stepped in it the last election and they wanted to start to at least begin to address it because here's what would happen if they don't address it uh then your normal everyday voter will stop voting and say look the system's rigged i don't i don't have any confidence in that system why would i vote it's just going to be what you want it to be anyway so they had to fix it so what they wanted to do is to do something that actually addresses the irregularity so it doesn't happen again uh, and what they've incorporated are all fully constitutional elements. Um, and here's, here's, the, here's the ironic thing. Our constitution, well, their state constitution and the constitution of the United States says that the votes should be cast by citizens. Now, the only way to make sure that a citizen is voting 
is to somehow reconcile their personal identification with their vote. And you can tell based on their personal identification, whatever that form of identification is, whether they're a citizen or not. And you only count the votes of citizens. So they've tried to address this issue. Now, here's, here's what really gets me. Um, voter disenfranchisement was always a big deal with people like Al Sharpton and, and you know, and, and Jesse Jackson. Now, you know, they'd be crying from the rooftop, voter disenfranchisement. Here's the thing, all of us are disenfranchised if there is even one vote cast from a non-citizen. So the way we begin to actually bring a semblance of being able to characterize every vote as illegal votes and not disenfranchise anyone is we have to put some safeguards there. And that's what they've done. These are minimal safeguards. These are not like a big deal, comparatively speaking with other states. So, uh, so the Major League Baseball had a knee-jerk reaction, and I hear it was Stacey Abrams, LeBron James, and Al Sharpton yeah. that sat down with Major yeah. League Baseball and encouraged MLB to move the venue. Now, these people should be held account uh, accountable as well as Major League Baseball because $190 million in commerce is a lot of jobs in Atlanta and surrounding areas. And uh, now those jobs are gone. And they've gone to Denver, Colorado, that has a population of less than 8% Black. And, and comparatively speaking, Atlanta is about 51% of the workforce are Black workers. Yeah. And so there's a huge disparity. And the ultimate disenfranchisement is when you take these good jobs, pay good paying jobs and good jobs away from people in our community, especially, that are suffering disproportionately compared to other communities, especially during COVID. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's crazy, it's unfortunate. And we at Every Black Life Matters are calling on Major League Baseball to then find venues that they can do. I, they were, I understand they've already moved the All-Star game, yes. but there's additional venues that they can do to bring revenue back to uh, the people in Atlanta and Georgians in particular. And uh, because what they've done what Georgia has done is just your basic uh, way of protecting the votes. Now, for those who would say that Blacks are uh, inept, like Biden has indicated, uh, yeah. and, and don't have access to the internet, and they're just too dumb to get on the internet and figure out uh, how, to, how to register for vaccines yeah. or how to vote, those people are the real racists. Those people that would infer that Blacks don't have any ID whatsoever. Yeah. Those people are the real racists because we know they're propagandists. That's not true. As a matter of fact, by uh, two thirds of all Blacks, about 70% said that we should have voter ID yeah. laws, 70%. So these people are out of step and they're just trying to rig the system so they can continue to do the fraudulent screen, the schemes that they've been doing for all these times. And we have yeah. to fix them. And, and, you know, what was also very uh, sad was to see Biden get on TV and declare that this was tied to Jim Crow laws, yeah. which we only want to get into that, has nothing to do with Jim Crow and the evils of Jim Crow, which was which what came to us by the Democrat Party. Exactly right. Jim Crow. All that yeah. stuff with Jim Crow was was put on blacks by Democrats. That's and right. They don't want to talk about that. But right. I just thought that was pretty evil for him to come out and to say this is tied to Jim Crow when all these people are trying to do is clean up the voter rolls in their yeah. state and make it legal. It's despicable. It's despicable. Yeah. 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 Now, what is systemic racism, Kevin? What is systemic racism? So, uh, so I, I went and I actually did a search on the term systemic and, and tried to figure out and try to characterize what it is. And this is something that we always cover in our workshops when we talk about critical race theory and we talk about systemic racism. So systemic, in short, is a system that is, is all that is designed to carry out a system-wide influence so that would be up, down, in and out, through and through. Everybody in that system has the same sort of, um, they're marching to the same beat, if I could say it that way. And they're trying to carry out a system-wide influence in a 
company culture, in society, whatever it may be. So systemic racism would mean that you would have an entire system and everybody that's a part of that system, at least by majority or plurality, would have to be marching to that same beat of trying to systemically, uh, to trying to influence racist uh, type uh, activities on other people. Now, I, I, I've done the research and I did find that there's at least one systemically racist uh, organization that is, that really fits that definition. And uh, so that definition is uh, that that one entity. Do you want me to go ahead and tell you what that well, entity yeah, is? We go right okay. on into Margaret Sanger. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the one entity that I found started in the early 1900s. The founder actually said, now, we don't want the word to get out, but we want to fully exterminate the Negro population. Yeah. Yep. And, and then started to set up their entities throughout urbanized black communities, black and brown communities. And they've been at it for a very, very long time. The ironic thing is, is that we have all of these progressives that are fully aligned with this organization that had even outed themselves last summer as systemically racist. That organization, as, you, as you've indicated, yeah. is Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. The founder is Margaret Sanger. And that's what her actual quote is. We don't want the word to get out that we want to fully exterminate the Negro population. So, um, so here's the deal. Um, uh, Planned Parenthood, I'll just give you some quick stats. So Planned Parenthood, uh, first of all, Blacks make up 13% of the population. Of that 13%, six and a half percent are women. Half of it are women. Of the six and a half percent that are women, only about half are, are actually childbearing age, 15 to 44. Um, so therefore, we have a three and a half percent demographic at best for Planned Parenthood to go after. And yet they, they put 80, by most estimates, 90% of their resources are in the Black community. So they're carrying out Margaret Sanger's goal of fully exterminating Blacks. So that is an organization that up, down, in and out, through and through, based on their mission, their charter, based on Margaret Sanger's words, they're marching to that beat. And though Margaret Sanger's not alive today, still Planned Parenthood is yeah. grossly majority white um, and, and, and they're carrying this out. Now, if they were sincere that they really, you know, this is about women's health care. If they were sincere about that, they, you know, you have a couple of organizations that have already done the demographic research and have set up their, their, their stores in areas that really get where a lot of women gather. That would be Target and Walmart. Now, if, if, if Planned Parenthood was sincere, that's about women's health care, you would just put a Planned Parenthood clinic on the back end or very closely uh, associated with every Walmart and every target in the country because it's about women's health care. But instead of that, they're planted in the black community to this very day. Now, Planned Parenthood in New York came out last July and actually said, yeah, we're systemically racist. Uh, Margaret Sanger was a racist bigot and they vowed it themselves. Now, uh, still people were running proudly and are running today in for political offices saying, I'm a proud Planned Parenthood supporter. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's what's ironic is, is if you or I said we were proud David Duke supporters, oh, we'd be goodness. castigated, yeah. rightfully cast, castigated up and down America, wouldn't have a place to live. These people, uh, Planned Parenthood is systemic racist, and they're proudly saying they're associated with them. And we start, we need to start holding these people accountable to that. Because yeah. that organization, if you're sincere about systemic racism, you can't, you can't overlook what Planned Parenthood is doing. Yeah, yeah. Un unfortunately, people do. Now, quickly, I want to go to the Second Amendment, which is under attack right yes. now. Yeah. And I want you to talk about that. Now, the executive order signed by uh, Joe Biden yesterday, he thinks that he could stop violence, but we know it's not even about stopping violence. It's, it's about separating the American citizen from their right to own, to bear arms and to protect themselves from the government, the Second Amendment is under attack right now. And, you know, kind of talk about this, but I want you to kind of expound on that a little bit. Yeah, so the second amendment, let's just talk about that a little bit here. So um, I'd like to go back historically. Uh, yeah. So historically, 
after slavery and during the times of reconstruction, there was one fundamental element that kept blacks free because even after reconstruction, we had a lot of, uh, you know, the South wanted to re-enslave blacks and uh, they wanted to try to, you know, of course, indenture servitude was offered but that's a negotiation between the plantation owner and the black. And, but there were a lot that said, look, we, we just wanna you know, have slavery in our county. We need to go and get all the blacks here to come on and, and continue to do our work, period. We need to re-enslave them. The thing, the one fundamental element that kept blacks free were firearms. Yes. These blacks, after they went and did the fighting in the, in the Civil War, they kept their firearms. Now there was an order for blacks to return the firearms and then go back to their, wherever they were working or living, but they didn't, blacks didn't. And what kept them free from lynching and from being re-enslaved are those firearms. And um, so KKK would have, would have damaged more than a, a couple of thousand people or several thousand people. I think it was about 3000 people they lynched, maimed, burned, harassed, et cetera. They would have done many more than that if, if, if Blacks didn't have the firearms. So we today need to stand firm that this is an essential part of our personal security. The Second Amendment is, is, is fundamental. It's fundamental to American history. It's fundamental to Constitution. It's fundamental to our community. Um, and this is not something that's arbitrary or that we should give up just because uh, now, what's what's crazy about it is how are you going to confiscate or put limitations on something while you have open borders? Yeah. The border is wide open, oh. according to Biden. He sees yes. it. So when you do that, what do you create? <laughs> you create a black market. Yeah. And the black market, guess who participates in that? The criminals. That's so right. now you create a black market for criminals to be fully armed. Yeah. You disarm and then you disband and you and you de demonetize a lot of police departments across the country. So guess who are the ones that at, at the end of the day are the most susceptible to crime? It's your good, God-fearing, honest citizens that are paying their taxes, taking care of their businesses, and we're the ones now that are really the targets. And it's so crazy when you think about it like that, but yeah. it's true. Yeah, so. it is, it's totally true. Uh, and yeah. yeah, yeah, because there we don't know what's coming across that border, but we know that there's criminals. It's like the oh, ones yeah. are all the way from Yemen that they yeah. caught. That's just what they caught. Yeah. We don't know yeah. what hasn't been caught. Exactly right. But, exactly right. Yeah. So Kevin, before we close, just tell me real quick, what 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 drives you, Kevin, to do what you do? What drives you? Real quick, the Bible. Ah. So uh, God is God is my primary influence. I try to live according to this, to the letter. The Bible for me is good enough. Yeah. Christ and what he did on the cross is good enough. That's it's right. all sufficient. That's and right. I'm not going to mix any theologies with it. I'm not going to sort of, you know, fiddle around the edges with it. This is what I stand on and what I encourage everybody to stand on because it is more than enough to sustain us in these times. And Absolutely. so I would encourage you and all of your listeners, please reacquaint yourself with this. All of our answers, all that we're going through is answered in this book, the Bible. And so I just thank God for his grace on my life and allowing me to do what I do. Uh, I would encourage you to please go to everyblm.com, find out more about our organization. We have great resources, tools, and uh, all kinds of things out there for, for your listeners and your podcast viewers. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Well, it's not enough time in the day to, to talk about all the things, but man, we've, I think we've covered a lot. And I'm so grateful to you and, and want to thank you for coming. But And I'm going to just do a final close with um, and thank my audience. But I want to ask you to, to close us in prayer. Okay. Uh, once I once I uh, give my thanks, but anyway, to to you, to my audience, I want to thank you for coming every week. Those of you who come and you listen, I'm just grateful for your time, the time that you spend to watch and and also to share these podcasts each week. I don't take them for granted. And don't forget to subscribe to DW's View. Stand up, hit the red button, so you know when my podcasts come out. And also. Uh, I'd love to have you be a sponsor 
I'm looking for people to sponsor this show and I would love to have you do that. And, and my word for you today, dear friends, is to stand up. Because guess what? If we do not stand up for what we believe and what's right, who will? Now, Kevin, close us in a word of prayer, if you would. Great, gladly. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're so grateful and thankful that you've given us the privilege of prayer. We don't take for granted that you've uh, allowed us to come together and to share ideas and, and just to uh, spend this time together. We thank you that everyone that is tuned in, that you have divinely assigned them to see this podcast. We ask that you would begin to work on the hearts and the minds of men, that you would lift the veil, that you allow them to see clearly your will, your way, your word, and its influence on their personal life directly. We just give you all the praise, glory, and honor for all of the fruits that would come out of this mighty podcast. We pray for Dolores. We pray for everybody associated with this production. And we just pray that your will will continue to uh, be more than enough grace that would allow them to have all maximum influence across America and around the world. We just thank you, Lord God, for everything that you've already done and everything that you are doing. And we thank you for all the lives that will be impacted by the uh, discussion that we've had today. Father, we just give you all the praise, glory, and honor. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen.